in the Operman Report bookstore and on my Facebook. We'll even have a link in the description of the, of the show. Okay, so then... And then uh, what if you're ha- from New York, then you should know about my Uncle Tony, who, was, uh, who actually they did the film on the waterfront about. When was his last name? Wild Bredo. Tony Anastasio. No, I, I wasn't familiar with that. No, no. Sorry. It was my father's brother. My father, the family name is Anastasio. My father changed his to Anastasia just to try to confuse people. But uh, his brothers all worked down at the docks. His, his brother ran the docks only because of Albert's strength. Well, then what happens? Tony, you get tough a- Tony Anastasia, Anastasio, they call him. Okay, I've heard that name. Tough Tony Anastasia. I've heard that name. Uh, now, yeah. but yeah, I'm a young guy. <laughs> but now, what happens next? You get into football. I was playing football, but I, you know, when I played, your class had to graduate before you were allowed to play pro ball. They didn't have any hardship cases, so I went up to. I had a tryout with the New York Jets and uh, a very successful tryout. But they, they had a uh, like a farm team on the, on the East Coast where we played. Was they called? It was like almost like a, having a baseball farm team. We played Jimmy Christie, a whole bunch of players played in there that before they went into the pros. And um, the year that I was eligible to play, there was uh, a lot of my friends were playing down in Philadelphia. They had a great young team, and I said to to Eubank, I said, you know, I'd like to go down and try play with Philadelphia for a year or so. He said, well, if it doesn't work out, you got a home here at New York. We we want you to play here, but, you know, it's up to yourself. And so I went down there, and then they hired this guy, Joe Q. Harrick, as a coach. And I watched this man trade a championship football team away. He traded Sonny Jurgensen and Tommy McDonald for a guy named Norman Snead. Traded, uh, it was just I mean, it was incredible what he did. So I just, uh, Ali had just won the title, and uh, we came out of a meeting one day, uh, and, and, and Q. Harrick walked right by Timmy Brown and I. And I turned around, and I said, don't you speak to people anymore? And the guy turned around and said, oh, and I said, you know what? Take this team and stick it up your ass. Hmm. And Timmy said, why are you out of trade me? So I went into boxing, and I said to somebody in Philadelphia, I said, you know, I can knock this guy out. <laughs> Ali, and he said, what a great idea. So. I spent uh, six months in the uh, in the gym, and uh, and ever I have I guess I was one of ten people in the history of boxing in the heavyweight division that ever became a world ranked fighter without boxing amateur. Give us an idea. Well, what position did you play in football before you got into boxing? Defensive end. And and how tall are you? And how much did you weigh? Because <laughs> you're like a I huge guy. Six six and. Uh, I was playing ball. I was weighing about 280. Whoa. When I started fighting, I was it took me down to 230. I mean, it was like skin and bone shaking. <laughs> it was a uh, and how it was old an were, experience. How old were you when you started fighting? 23. Uh, now, when, when you were doing the stuff, you know, you were training for the football and uh, fighting and stuff. Were you still doing stuff with organized crime? Just doing stuff on the side? Oh well, yeah, I mean, it was <laughs> the, the football, and the, you know, you had to have a day job, so. Right. Playing sports was my day job, you know. And how were you making money? What, what, what were you doing? Can you talk about it? Well, we we were we we, we took care of a lot of unions, and uh, there was a we I had a, a I had a great job as a I ran depots for uh, Tasty Freeze ice cream. Carol Brothers. It was called Carol Brothers. They were ice cream, soft ice cream trucks that had hamburgers and everything on it. There was an outfit out of Chicago. And we had a depot in Newark, and then we had one in Queens. Okay, and you were just there keeping the trucks running on time? Well, just making sure. You know, it was, again, a day job, you know. Gotcha. But we took care of the unions, and you know, uh, I ran around with Hoffa and a few other people, and uh, we took care of a lot of the uh, uh, union business and uh, just a, a lot of family business. Okay, so then you, you start fighting. Give us an idea of some of the people you fought. Oh, man. I fought everybody. Uh, the only person that was signed to fight four times with Ali, but we never really got it on. He was always apologizing. And uh, But I fought Norton. I fought Cleveland Williams. I fought Terry Daniels. I fought Carl Gizzi. I fought uh, the champ of Wales. I fought uh, Bugner. I fought uh, uh, Foreman. I fought uh, uh, Cleveland, Cleveland Williams, uh, Alvin Blue Lewis. Uh, 
Manuel Ramos. Uh, I knocked out Manuel Ramos when he was number two in the world. I beat uh, I beat uh, I beat Alvin Blue Lewis when he was ranked number one in the world. I beat Cleveland Williams when he was number six in the world. I beat Terry Daniels when he was number eight in the world. I beat uh, I, I had a pretty uh, speculative career, you know. Yeah, Ron Lyle too. You looked out. Now, and uh, th- this was boxing in its heyday. This was like uh, when uh, they were really fighting, right? <laughs> well, my problem was, you know, if I would have, I, I had two things that were two things that were difficult situation. First of all, I would take a fight on two days' notice. Uh, you know, I, if I ever went to camp like these guys do and trained six months, no one would have ever beaten me ever, ever. I mean, I every time I got in shape, I destroyed world ranked fighters. And you know, I, when I fought Ken Norton in San Diego, I, I trained four days for the fight. Mm. They uh, called me up on the phone and they said, uh, "You want to fight Kenny Norton?" I said, and I had I had like uh, six indictments for union business on me. And I I said, "Where's the ticket at?" And the guy said, "You'll take the fight." I said, "Where's the ticket? Send me a ticket. Where's the fight at? San Diego. Yeah, I'll take it. I wanted to get out of town." So I, I Joe Biden believes in the future of American manufacturing. I don't buy for one second. The vitality of American manufacturing is a thing of the past. And his plan puts American workers first. We will reward companies for creating good paying jobs here at home to deliver on the promise to buy American. Joe Biden's economy will work for us. And we're going to make it happen with American determination and American union workers. I'm Joe Biden, candidate for president, and I approve this message. Paid for by Biden for president. You're invited to a huge grand opening celebration of Once Upon a Child in Sarasota this Thursday, September 24th through Sunday, September 27th. On Thursday and Friday, the first 25 customers get a free tote and a $10 gift card just for stopping by. Saturday, enjoy our live entertainment from 2 to 5, and Sunday, get double reward points all day long. Once Upon a Child Sarasota's grand opening is this Thursday through Sunday. Visit onceuponachildsarasota.com for more information and check us out on Facebook. So I went out on a week's notice uh, for the Norton fight, and I gave him the worst licking he ever had. I actually beat Norton, and they, they took the decision. Now, it was one of the greatest heavyweight fights in California. It was a, it was a trippy fight. Now, were any of those fights like on Wild World of Sports and Saturday afternoon, that kind of stuff? That I would have seen. Uh, I don't. I, probably the Norton fight's been been shown around. Uh, the Foreman fight was. Uh, the Blue Lewis fight was. Uh, Cleveland Williams and Terry Daniels. Those fights were done down in Texas because they were looking for a fighter to fight Frazier. And uh, when I beat when I beat Terry Daniels. Uh, they were looking for a white guy to fight Frazier. So they would beat Terry Daniels. I flew back to Philadelphia on a plane with Yank Durham. And he, he said, if you beat one more good fighter, you can have the Frazier fight. And I said, you know, you name the place and the time, send me a ticket. So a month later, I fought Cleveland Williams down in his hometown in Houston. And I beat Cleveland Williams hands down. And uh, Terry Daniels got the Frazier fight and Cleveland Williams fought George Savallo. So it was a... Uh, Kind of a comedy of errors, you know. Well, well if you were in with guys like uh, Marl Lansky and Frank Costello, uh, could, couldn't they help you with your career in in boxing, get you the right fights? They, uh, it was uh, a very, it was uh, I, I was I had a contract with Sam Margolis, who was the head of the Jewish mob in Philly, who had Liston, and and I was undefeated for my first sixteen fights because I, I and I fought some good fighters, but. I uh, I just was I wouldn't listen to anybody. I, I too many things. I was living in Boston. I was living in Philly. I was I was up and down the East Coast. I was in New York. I was you know, I I I liked my day job. I liked my night job better than my day job. You know. And, and uh, Steve, I guess, was telling me that uh, the part of Rocky is partially based on you. That's my life. I mean, I I did uh, I did a film called Farewell, My Lovely. It was the first movie. The film career, they, they, what 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 these guys did more for me was they tried to get me off the streets. So they 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 kept they kept throwing movies in my face. When I was in Boston, when I was starting boxing, I was up in Boston, and they uh, they, they Steve McQueen came in to do the Thomas Crown Affair, and Steve and I became very good friends because we looked after him, we took care of him when he was up there. And he said, come on, man, come down to the set. I'm going to put you in this movie. I'll get you a card and everything. You know, come to Hollywood, man. We'll have a good time. And 
Uh, and I said, I don't think so. It's just, you know. So then they came to me to do a picture called The Great White Hope mm. uh, with James Earl Jones. And, and I I had just knocked out Manuel Ramos, who was number two in the world. And then wanted me to quit boxing. And, and, and Raymond Patriarchus set that whole thing up in Rhode Island because he wanted me off the street. And and I I turned it down. They, they I mean, it was a done deal. All I had to do was sign the contract. And I gave the part to Jim Beatty. I said, there's a guy in Minneapolis just retired from boxing. He, he needs a job. Give him a call. And they, so they, then they came to me when I retired. They, they came to me to do a picture of Farewell, My Lovely with Robert Mitchum. And I said, you know, it's time. So I came to Hollywood, and it's all Mitchum's fault. Ah, hey, that must have been cool, hanging out with Mitchum, huh? Robert was terrific. Robert was like a fa- surrogate father. He was a, he was a just an amazing, amazing, amazing man. He uh, he did a great. I mean, he he took me by the hand and just walked me through the business and showed me a lot of very uh, you know good things that, that I needed to know. And, and and the picture worked out extremely well. Farewell, my lovely is a classic film today. Yeah, Phil great Marlo, movie. Yeah. Now, out of all your movies, because I'm looking through them here, King Kong, Superman, Superman 2, uh, which one, and then Dragnet, which uh, I got to talk to you about that in a minute. Uh, but uh, for the listeners who can't see your face right now, which one do you think they would recognize you, the most recognizable film you're in? Well, I mean, Superman movies are iconic. You know, they're yeah. so huge. Uh, I mean, here you are 40 years later, and they're still the best of the, they're the, best of the Superman films that were ever done. You know, there'll never be another Christopher Reeve. They're never going to find another Christopher. And and we, and we, you know, and Richard Donner was a great director. But Farewell, My Lovely is probably one of my favorite films because of the fact of of Mitchum and the relationship. And it was a great cast. It was it was a you know, we had a lot of fun doing it. It was a uh, the film came out very well. And I, I I probably that year would have gotten nominated for supporting actor, but. You know, they, Mitchum set up a meeting for me with Johnny Carson to do uh, the Johnny Carson show. And I met him at the Polo Lounge and he said to me, you know, if you come on the show, I'm going to get you nominated because I love the film. I think it's a great movie. And you did a brilliant job in it. And, uh, and Mitchum loves you. And I said, OK, so I said, your show is live, isn't it? Yeah. And I said, well, I don't think I can do it. He said, well, what are you talking about? I said, well. I'm going to come on your show. You're going to ask me about my father, and I'm going to ask you where the men's room's at. Mm-hmm. He said, you would get up and leave? I said, yeah. He said, well, 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 why? I said, because I don't want anybody talking about my father. And it was at a time when I was very guarded because I had just come off the streets. And he uh, he said, well, 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 we'll construct some questions that will just go around the issue and everything. And uh, uh, and I said, you know, listen, you're the number one news reporter on television today. You have Albert Anastasia's son sitting on your on your set, and you're not going to ask me about him when nobody talks about him? I said, you know, I, I don't, please don't take any offense, but I didn't fall off a turnip truck here. So I got up and left, and, and Mitch called me on the phone. He said, are you out of your mind? What is wrong with you? He said, this is Hollywood. Who cares? You know, and I should have listened, actually. Well, and you never had another chance to get back with Johnny. I I saw him several times afterwards, and he you know he kept telling me, "Please come on the show." But it was you know you have an opportunity to do something when the picture's hot and it's yeah. coming out and stuff. You know, if you don't follow through with what you're supposed to do, I mean, I I should have done probably fifty movies, but I I picked and choose what I wanted to do, and you know because I I enjoy the business a lot, and it's uh, you know and everything I've ever done. Uh, came out very well. I'm very fortunate in that manner. And you were saying oh. that the, the anniversary of Superman's coming up, and you're going to be doing a bunch of appearances on that, and people can find those on the schedule at the familylegacythenovel.com coming up. Now, now your character uh, when you must when you did Superman, people must have been stopping you in the street at that point, uh, right? Well, they, I mean, they were from Farewell, My Lovely, actually, but yeah, right. they you know it, uh, Superman was. When I did the Superman movie and I met Richard Donner, I was doing a film with Gene Hackman called March or Die down in, in uh, Spain. And we, Hackman fell off a horse and we had time. We went up to London to meet Donner for, uh, for the Superman movie. And, uh, and we had a discussion about how this character uh, to play a mute character, you know, like that. And I said, absolutely, I want to do it because 
Jackie Gleason was a friend of mine, mm. and he did a picture called Gigo that he won an Oscar for. He played a deaf, dumb mute. And I said, if I ever get an opportunity 